Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and in this topic we're going to be looking at dynamic engineering systems. Now we have already looked at static engineering systems, which are systems where no movement occurs. And by contrast, a dynamic engineering system is one where we do have movement. So we need to evaluate movement for dynamic systems. So to begin with, on the left hand side, we have all of the quantities that are relevant when we apply our linear equations of motion. So right at the top, we have time, which is represented by a lowercase t, and the standard international units for time are seconds. Our second quantity then is displacement, which is represented by a lowercase s, and the SI units for displacement are metres. We have velocity and initial velocity. Initial velocity takes the letter u, whereas final velocity takes the letter v, and both of those are measured in metres per second. Now quite often velocities are expressed in miles per hour or kilometres per hour, but we need to make sure we convert those to metres per second before applying them in any of the equations on the right hand side. And finally, we have acceleration A, which is measured in metres per second squared. Now over on the right hand side, we have our key equations of motion. We have two equations of motion for displacement. S equals U plus V over 2, all times T. Now that term U plus V over 2 is the average of our initial and our final velocity. We multiply that by the time and we get the distance travelled or the displacement. Our second equation of motion states that s equals ut plus a half at squared, or the displacement equals the initial velocity times time, plus a half times the acceleration times time squared. And our third and fourth equations involve velocity. We have v equals u plus at, or final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time. And then our final equation of motion is v squared equals u squared plus 2as. Now the habit that I want you to get into when you approach questions involving equations of motion is to read the question fully, list all of the variables that are given in the question, and then you can select the appropriate equation to find the variable of interest. So let's say for example, you're trying to calculate velocity. And in the question, you're given an initial velocity, you're given an acceleration, and you're given a distance traveled. Well, bearing all of that in mind, we're looking for an equation that contains s, v, u and a, but no other variables. Now, hopefully you can see by referring to the equations that in that instance, the equation you would need to use would be the one at the bottom, because it contains v, it contains u, it contains a, and it contains s. Let's take another example. Let's say, for example, a question asks you to calculate the time taken, and in the question, you're able to establish the initial velocity of the vehicle or object, you're able to establish the acceleration of the vehicle or object, and you're able to establish the final velocity. So now we're looking for an equation that involves u, v, a and t. So once again, hopefully you can see that the equation we want to use is this one here. So let's take a quick look at how we would go about applying the equations of motion. So here we've got a vehicle, and that vehicle is going to travel a distance or has a displacement of 25 metres. We'll add this to our diagram. The vehicle is going to be travelling 25 metres. And the final velocity of that vehicle, after it's travelled 25 metres, is going to be 45 kilometres per hour. So V is 45 kilometres per hour. Its acceleration is 1.5 metres per second squared. And what we want to know is what its velocity is before it starts its acceleration. So over here, u equals question mark. So if we think about how a descriptive question might be worded, it may say something like a vehicle travels a distance of 25 metres. After travelling 25 metres, its final velocity is 45 kilometres per hour. Given that the vehicle accelerates at 1.5 metres per second squared, what was the initial velocity of the vehicle? Or something like that. So what we would do is we would read the question and we would extract the information that we've got on the left hand side of the page there. The next thing we need to do is to make sure all of our variables are in SI units. So displacement there, 25 metres, that's in SI units. Acceleration, 1.5 metres per second squared, that's in SI units. But our final velocity, 45 kilometres per hour 
is not in SI units. We need to convert that to meters per second. Now I use a small trial to represent this because I'm converting kilometers per hour into meters per second. So we notice something. We're converting the distance from kilometers to meters, but we're also converting the time from hours to seconds. Now when we're converting both, we can go via a middle ground of meters per hour or kilometers per second, either way. And that means we're just converting one of the variables at a time. So if we have a vehicle that's traveling 45 kilometers per hour, and we want to know how many meters it's traveling per hour, then hopefully you can see it will be traveling 45,000 meters. So times 1,000 will get us from kilometers per hour to meters per hour. But we don't want to stop at meters per hour. We want meters per second. And if a vehicle is traveling 45,000 meters per hour, and we want to know how far it's traveling every second, we need to divide that by 3600. Zero, zero. Now where that 3600 zero, zero comes from is we divide by 60 to get from hours to minutes, and then we divide by another 60 to get from minutes to seconds. So that gives us our complete conversion. So our overall conversion factor then is times 1000 over 3600. Zero, zero. Now we've got an option here. We can either memorize our conversion factor for kilometers per hour to meters per second, and it's times 1000 over 3600. Zero. Or what I prefer is to use these trails where I can convert easily from kilometers per hour to meters per hour by times in by 1000, and I can convert easily from meters per hour to meters per second by dividing by 3600. Zero. Either way is fine, so long as you can accurately convert from kilometers per hour to meters per second. So for the purpose of this example, I'll use the conversion factor. V equals 45 kilometers per hour. We need it in meters per second. So I'm going to times that by 1,000 over 3600, zero, zero, which gives me a final velocity of 12.5 meters per second. So the 12.5 meters per second and the 45 kilometers per hour are equivalent. They're the same. They're just in different units. So the next thing we need to do is determine which equation to use. And if we look at our variables, we know S, the displacement. We know V, the final velocity. We know A, the acceleration. And we're trying to find U, the initial velocity. So of those equations that we had on the previous slide, we're looking for one that contains S, U, V, and A. Now you also have these on the equations and information sheet for this topic. So you always have those to refer back to if you need them. And that equation and information sheet will also give you the SI units of all of the variables included here. So referring to the equations, I know that the equation I need to use to solve this is V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. It's the only equation that contains all of those variables and no others. Now we're trying to solve for u, the initial velocity, so I need to get u on its own. And the way that I would do that, first of all, is by subtracting 2as from each side. 2as is just a block, it's just a number, it's just a term, and we can move terms in one step. So I'm going to minus 2as from each side of my equation, and I'll be left with u squared equals v squared minus 2as, because I've subtracted it from each side. Now the final step then for getting u on its own is to square root each side of the remaining equation. So u is going to be the square root of everything I have on the right hand side there, v squared minus 2as. So plugging in our numbers, we get u equals the square root of v squared well, V in meters per second is 12.5 minus 2 times my acceleration is 1.5 and my distance is 25 meters. And when I run all of that through my calculator, I get U equals 9.01 meters per second. I know it's meters per second because all of the units I've used throughout have been SI units. 
Now, if I wanted to express that in kilometers per hour, I can do that using a similar box trail. This time I'm going from meters per second to kilometers per hour. So I'm going to go via kilometers per second. Now, if I know how fast I'm traveling in meters per second, or I know the distance I'm traveling per second in meters, then I can divide it by a thousand to get the distance I'm traveling per second in kilometers. And if I know the distance I'm traveling per second in kilometers, this time I need to times it by 3600 to get the distance I'm traveling per hour in kilometers. So my conversion from meters per second to kilometers per hour this time is going to be times 3600 zero, zero over a thousand. And what you'll notice is that it's the inverse of the conversion to go the opposite way from kilometers per hour to meters per second. In fact, we could add it to our diagram. We were traveling in the opposite direction, like so. So to finish this off then, if we want the initial velocity in kilometers per hour, we've got 9.01 times 3600 zero, zero over a thousand, which gives us 32.4 kilometers per hour, and that's just a one decimal place. So our car was traveling up here at the start at 32.4 kilometers per hour. It traveled 25 meters whilst accelerating at 1.5 meters per second squared, and its final velocity was 45 kilometers per hour. So I'm going to stick with the same example, except this time I'm going to calculate the time taken for that acceleration to occur. And to our list of variables, I'm going to add our initial velocity in meters per second, because that's the format we need it in for the next step of the calculation, 9.01 meters per second. And as mentioned before, I'm going to calculate the time taken for that acceleration to occur. We have a much broader range of variables to choose from now, because we know the acceleration, we know the initial velocity, and we know the final velocity. We also know the distance traveled. So the equations that we could choose from, we could use S equals U plus V over 2 times T. We could use S equals UT plus a half AT squared. We could even use V equals U plus AT. Any of those contain variables we have, and they also contain the variable we're trying to find, which is time T. Now, nobody likes to make things difficult for themselves, so I think automatically we can rule out the one in the middle. We're trying to find t, and in that equation, t is in two terms. One of those t's is squared, one of those is to the power 1. So that's going to make things more complicated, which leaves v equals u plus a t, and s equals u plus v over 2 times t. And I'm going to use v equals u plus a t. So I have v equals u plus a t. And I want to rearrange that to make t the subject. So the first thing I'm going to do is strip away all terms that don't involve t from the right hand side. So I'm going to subtract u from each side. And that's going to give me a t is v minus u. And finally, to get t on its own, I need to divide each side by a. And I'll be left with t equals v minus u over a. Plugging in my numbers, I get v. Remember to use the SI unit values. So 12.5 minus u, 9.01, over the acceleration, 1.5. And that gives me 2.33 seconds to two decimal places. So just to demonstrate that you would get the same answer if you use the alternative equation that we started with, we have S equals U plus V over 2 times T. Now the first thing I need to do to get T on its own is times each side by 2. So I'll get 
S is U plus V times T. And then the next thing I would need to do is divide each side of that by U plus V. So my first step was times by 2. My second step is divide by U plus V. And I'll get T equals 2S divided by U plus V. Therefore, T equals 2 times 25 over 12.5 plus 9.01. And if you run that through your calculators, you'll get 2.33 seconds again. So this goes to show that we have alternatives because all of those equations of motion hold true. So just a quick reminder of the key steps. First of all, read the question and extract the important information. So extract any information about distances, velocities, accelerations, and so on. Then convert all of your variables to SI units. Next, you select an equation that contains only the variables you're trying to find and the variables you know. And then it's just a case of rearranging, inputting your values, calculating your answer, and adding units to your final answer. The other important thing to remember is the units for your final answer will be SI units, providing you use SI units for all of the variables that you input into your equations.